The following recording is a presentation of the Brian Baptist Church of Rohnert Park, California, and of Pastor Val Mark Smith. We are an independent Baptist congregation committed to the accurate presentation of the historical doctrines of the faith. We welcome you to visit our services anytime here in the Rohnert Park area. I'd like you to take your Bibles, if you would, please, and open them to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. In today's message, we continue our study of the Lord's return. As I mentioned a moment ago, we'll have many more weeks of this study, going down into chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians in verse number 3. We'll have the opportunity to talk not only about the rapture, the coming of the Lord for His people, the church, but we'll also uh, speak of the time of tribulation. We'll talk of the uh, speak of the return of Christ in, in, as he establishes his kingdom on the earth. And then we'll take several messages to uh, speak also of that millennial kingdom, the 1,000-year reign of Jesus Christ on the earth, a very, very blessed time. And then we conclude that part of the study by talking about the last part of the day of the Lord, and that is the judgment that he brings upon those who are not believers in Jesus Christ. Now, you remember the wonderful promise that Christ made to his disciples in the last hours before his death. He said that he was leaving them. He referenced the death of the cross, but they didn't really understand what he meant. And he said that he was going to prepare a place for them and that he would come again and he would take them to be with him where he was. And he told them that they already knew how to get to this place. Um, he was going uh, to go someplace, but that immediately provoked a question from them. They said, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And then Jesus said, I am the way. And he meant that believing in him is the way to eternal life. They believed, and so they, they could have sure hope that they would go to be with him. And so it's been for 2,000 years the promise of Christ's return is still real. And when he returns, he says that he will take all believers home to be with him. He didn't say when it would be, didn't say how long, but he does tell us that it will happen suddenly, that he will come without warning. And he expected and does expect that his disciples will be prepared for his arrival. Now this, this is the issue in the passage that's before us today. The church at Thessalonica believed in Christ. They heard Paul. He was the missionary who came to give them the gospel. They believed that he told the truth. And they accepted the words that he said as words were that came from God. And their faith was placed in Christ. And because of that faith, Paul gave them the assurance that they would go up to be with Christ. But like Christians are prone to be, they were confused about all of this. They, they thought that the return of Christ was suddenly upon them, that Paul is saying, right now, Christ is going to come. And he, you need to be ready at this very moment because he, he could appear tomorrow. He could appear in the next few hours, wherever it might be. Pack your bags and get ready. And some of them looked at the coming of Christ in that way. Persecutions were upon them and... Some of them were confused because Paul said, you'll be delivered from persecution. And that hadn't happened. So in their minds, they thought, well, what must have happened then is that Jesus came and he didn't tell us about it. And here we are waiting and we have no hope that he will come to get us. Still others were concerned that some of them had died since Paul was there. And they wondered what happened to people that died. Will they have a part in God's kingdom? Will they reign with Christ? And then they were afraid that they would die. The same thing would happen to them. And then they would be pushed down to have a lower status in Christ's kingdom. So Paul wrote this section to explain and to calm their anxieties that nobody who is a believer in Christ needs to fear that they'll miss any promise that's been made by the Savior. Christ will take care of them. And all they need to do is to understand the order, understand the events that will take place when Christ comes and the means by which he will fulfill his promise. So this is written to give them comfort, as we see in verse number 18, comfort as they are in a time of persecution and they anticipate Christ's return. 
in your Bibles, if you'll look at verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now let me briefly revisit our previous discussions. Paul had already spoken to them about the return of Christ. We see it several times in the previous chapters. In chapter 1, he said, These believers in Thessalonica had proved their faith in Christ. They'd shown their love for Christ. They'd shown that they did believe in the hope of his return. And they proved that by example. They were examples of the way that Christians should live. They were examples before other believers or other people in Macedonia and Achaia. Their faith was real and that was demonstrated because they had turned from worshiping dead idols to serve the living and true God. And Paul said, you are waiting for Christ's Son to return from heaven. In chapter 2, he said, you are my crown of rejoicing. Or in other words, their belief in the gospel coming to Jesus Christ was proof of the success of the ministry. That the gospel does work. That people who believe in Jesus Christ will be saved. And then in chapter 3, he prayed that their faith and their, and their love and their hope would increase. And he prayed they would be holy before God when Christ returns. And now in this chapter, after he's expanded upon their sanctification, that need to be holy and to walk pleasing to God, now he proceeds to tell them more about this great event of Christ's return. In verse 13, he begins by saying, I don't want you to be ignorant. Ignorance of the truth is always disconcerting. Ignorance breeds uncertainty. Ignorance causes lack of assurance. And Paul wanted them to be steadfastly sure of the hope that they had because the best workers for Jesus Christ are the ones that are sure of what they're doing, sure of what they believe, sure of their faith, sure of their, of their love for Christ, sure of the hope of his return. So he says, I don't want you to be ignorant. I don't want you to sorrow as those that have no hope. And he meant that Christians should never live with the equivalent sorrow of unbelievers, that as if they have nothing to look forward to but wrath that is to come. Now, although they did know they were saved, they wouldn't experience God's wrath. They knew this, and yet still they had the sorrow of uncertainty, of misunderstanding. What happened to their loved ones that died? That's what they want to know. And they were sad. But Paul says, you don't need to be. And so as he went on to explain, he says, don't sorrow because those that died are doing nothing but sleeping. They are sleeping saints. In verse 14, he says, those that die in Jesus are only asleep. The body goes to sleep. The body is in a resting place. And that's what a cemetery is. When a person goes into the cemetery, if he is a believer in Christ, that cemetery is a resting place. That's what that word actually means. The soul of a person who dies goes immediately to be in the presence of Jesus Christ. That person is conscious in the heavenly world while only his body is asleep in the grave. So there's no reason to sorrow over them. They're not going to miss anything because the Bible promises that those who are believers in Christ when they die, only the body sleeps. And so anyone who, who believes that same power that raised up Jesus Christ is the power by which they will be raised. Raised by the power of God. Christ will raise their bodies and then the spirit that has gone to heaven already will come back to re-inhabit the resurrected body. So we talked about sorrowing saints and we've spoken of sleeping saints. And now I want to continue the discussion from last week about the surviving saints. 
First there are the sorrowing, and then there are the sleeping. And now we speak of the surviving saints. These are people that are alive when Christ returns. Not everybody is going to die, obviously, before Jesus comes. Some people will be alive when he gets here. And they're blessed to be alive uh, and not go through death. They'll go straight to heaven without ever dying. And that's not to say that there's any sorrow for those that, that die. Uh, they are also blessed. But the person who is alive when Christ comes will not face that unknown of death. Now I think of the testimony of our, of our brother Victor Irvine who uh, passed away back in December. Months before he died, he knew of his impending death. He had cancer. He learned that he had cancer. And when he did, he began to look forward to the day of his death. Seemed like a same strange thing to some of us, but he looked forward to the day of his death because he knew that he would go to be his, with his wife that had died just about a year and a half before. He knew that he would be in the presence of Jesus Christ when he got to heaven. And so he began to anxiously look forward to the time that he would die. But as the days wore on, and as the pain increased from that terrible disease... He was faced with the uncertainty of not knowing how it feels to die. And that's natural for us. None of us knows. And it doesn't mean that we don't have faith. If you might be afraid of the day that you'll die, it doesn't mean that you'll have faith. It just means that you have never stared down death's corridor. You don't know exactly what happens in the mind of a person when that hour of death comes upon them. As I say, it doesn't mean that they don't have faith that they become frightened of that time. It's just that it's never happened to them. They don't know about it, and we don't understand it just yet. So I would say then that there is a blessing to be alive when Christ comes. Certainly a blessing, because we don't go through death, and we're to hope for Christ's return. We're to look for His coming. Why? Because Paul says, you're going up. You're going up to be with Christ. You won't have to die. You'll live with him forever. Well, I'd like to speak to you for a few minutes about those that are alive when Christ returns. Now, we've already spoken of the bodies of those that die. But what about the bodies of the person that is living? When Christ comes, what happens to their body? What does he do with it? Well, first I'll say that they must wait. They must stand by for just a moment when Christ comes. They must bide their time for just a moment and watch because verse number 15 says that we which are alive will not prevent those that are asleep. Now you read that and you may wonder what does that mean? What, what does that mean we won't prevent them that are asleep? Why would we want to prevent anyone from going up to be with the Lord? How would we prevent anyone from going? So most of the time when I read this text aloud, I change the old King James wording to say, we shall not precede them which are asleep. In the 400 years since the King James was translated, many words have changed their meaning. Today, the word prevent means something different than what it did in 1611. Today, the word prevent means to hinder. It means to stop something from happening, but in 1611, it didn't mean that. For example, we read in Psalm 119, verse 147, David says, I prevented the dawning of the morning and cried, I hoped in thy word. And we say, well, that's very strange. How would David prevent the dawn? Well, David didn't prevent the dawn. He just means that he got up before dawn. His wakening preceded the sunrise. So the meaning of prevent has changed. Back then it meant proceed. Now that leaves us with a question. Is the King James Version, is it a perfect translation? Well, we'll say it is the Word of God. But we have to admit there are some translation issues for the modern reader. So we've got to learn what those old words mean so we can put them into our modern English. So here in verse number 15, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent, or we shall not precede them which are asleep. 
For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So the dead, those that are in the graves, they will rise first. Now, interestingly, that can be translated as the dead shall stand up. Like Lazarus, their bodies will be energized to stand up and come out of their graves. So the surviving saints, as I said, must wait. I don't know how long, but just a very, very brief time it appears. They must wait and then watch as the dead bodies of saints stand up and then come out of their graves. Now those souls that come back from heaven, the ones that have already died and they come back with Christ, they are in a body. Now they're in a temporary body. It's not the resurrected body because that body is not yet gone up. But when they come back with Christ, they'll come with him in a temporary body. And then when the bodies are, their bodies are called out of the graves at the resurrection, then their spirit will go into that resurrected body in a glorified body that's made like Christ. Well, let's talk for a minute about the surviving saints and their bodies. We've already said they won't die. So look at verse number 17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. They will be, or living believers, will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. The saints will be snatched up. Now, the Greek word that we have here is harpazo. It's a word that means to seize or to carry off by force or snatch away. The word is used in John 10, 42, which says that the wolf catches harpazo, the sheep, and scatters the flock. Jesus used the word again in John 10, 28, when he said, no one can pluck us, harpazo, out of the Father's hand. Again in Jude verse number 23, and others say with fear, pulling them out of the fire. Pulling them, that is harpazo. Also in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 2, Paul was caught up, the scripture says. Paul was harpazo, caught up into heaven and caught up to God. That is, that he ascended up into heaven. Revelation 12 verse 5, it says that the man-child was harpazo, that is, caught up to God. That's a reference to the ascended Christ. So the idea is there is an external force. There is a power by which the living will be snatched up. And that power is the power of Christ. It's the same power that raised him from the dead. This is a power that is a life-giving force. A power that is an eternal life-giving force. So this snatching up, this being caught up is what we use today, or the word we use today, is the rapture. Now, you ought not to look for the word rapture in the King James because you'll not find it. It's not there, but the concept is the word rapture that we use is taken from the Latin translation. It translates this same word, this same Greek word, harpazo, as rapturo, and out of that it gets transliterated into the word that we use, the word rapture. But there's no difference in meaning at all. Harpazo, rapturo, it's all being caught up, being snatched up, being raptured. Now, if you'll turn to 1 Corinthians 15, we can learn something about what happens to the bodies of surviving saints. The apostle explains in verses 35 to 50 that bodies that die and go into the grave will be resurrected but the body that comes out of the grave is not exactly like the body that went in. It will be different. But it's not so different that it's unrecognizable. When Jesus arose from the grave, there was nobody that mistook him and said, I wonder if that's Moses. I wonder if that's Fred. I wonder if that's Uncle Joe who came out of the grave. No, they, they knew who he was. They recognized him. On the Mount of Transfiguration, when Christ appeared in his glory, it says that Moses and Elijah appeared with him. Peter, James, and John were there at the Transfiguration. And I don't know how, but they recognized Moses and Elijah. They were in a body that was recognizable. And so when you get to heaven, you'll have this kind of a body. You'll have a body that's recognized as you. 
Jesus said the rich man died and went to hell and then he looked up into heaven and there he saw Lazarus and Abraham in heaven. He recognized them because they were in a body that was recognizable. Now we need, to, we need to understand the resurrected body to learn more about the bodies of the living at Christ's return. There are some changes that need to be made to the body. Now we'll put this today under the heading of the construction of the resurrected body. We need to know what happens to that resurrected body to understand what will happen to the living body. So we're going to back up just a little bit now to talk about the body that comes out of the grave when Christ comes. Now reading from 1 Corinthians 15 beginning in verse 35 if you'll follow with me. Verse 35, but some man will say, how are the dead raised up and with what body do they come? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened, that is, it's not made alive, except it die. It has to die first. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain. It may chance of wheat or some other grain, but God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit, that was not first, which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth earthy, the second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy, and as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. In verse 35, Paul asked, he says, They will ask, you will ask, and you may very well ask, with what body do they come? What is that body that comes out of the grave? What is that body like? Well, I've answered part of that. It's an identifiable body. It looks like you. Well, thank God that our opinions of beauty will change because I was kind of hoping that some of you would not look like you. But you will look like you. And if you look at verse number 41, this is, this is interesting and it might contain a clue about the resurrected body. Verse 41 says, There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars, for one star differed from another star in glory. There are some who say, well, th this verse has a double meaning. In one way, he's talking about the sun and the moon. Those are heavenly bodies. The sun is far more spectacular than the moon, and that can be one meaning. But he also might mean that our heavenly bodies will be different from each other in more ways than just the identity. Perhaps it's not even so much about the body, but about the makeup of this body. That some will receive more rewards when they get to heaven. Everybody's going to be happy in heaven, but some have greater happiness because of greater rewards through years of service. Some will have a greater capacity to enjoy heaven. And so if you want a, a more incentive to serve Christ in this life, then think about the eternal benefits that come from that. You have greater capacity to enjoy that heavenly place because you are rewarded for serving Christ in this life. Now, what kind of body is it? There's information in verses 42 and 43. 
so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. Now the body that goes into the grave bears all the marks of the fallen nature. When someone dies unexpectedly, one of the oddest things that you'll hear at a funeral is that somebody says, oh, what an untimely death. At least he died healthy. Who dies healthy? Every, every person is cursed. We're cursed with death. And that goes all the way back to Adam and the fall. But when the body comes out of the grave, it's not going to be a cursed body. It's a different body. It's constructed differently. God puts it all back together minus one very important detail, and that's the curse. God removes the curse. You know, nobody knows what Adam was like before he sinned. And they tell us that humans use only 2% of the total mental capacity that we're capable of. Some of you exist on far less, I think. But we use 2% of our minds. Now, Adam was a perfect man, and, and when God created him, he had a brain that was operating at 100%. Can you even imagine what we would be able to do if our brains operated at 100%? But I want to tell you that the body that you will receive when you go to heaven is far better than a body that you have on earth. Even operating at 100%, your body is not going to be as great as that body that you'll receive when you get to heaven. So I'll give you some reasons, three reasons why it's a better body than Adam's original body, even the one operating at 100%. Now first, it's built to survive. It's a body that's built to survive. The resurrection body must last. It has to last a long, long time. It can't wear out because it must be here for eternity. You ever thought how you would survive heaven? If, if your body could enter heaven as it is, you would not survive. In fact, as soon as you walked in, somebody would show you the door. You can't survive there because you'd walk in with all your germs. And you, you would walk in with all your sicknesses. You'd come in with all your troubles. You'd come in with all the evil thoughts. This is body that we have is a body built for this world. The resurrection body is built for another world. In this world, things perish. In that world, things don't perish. The body's never going to die in that world. Now, after I'd been at the hospital for three weeks with my wife this past summer, I got home finally and opened up the refrigerator door and I found out that the cheese had started its own garden of growth. And that's because the cheese was perishing. The cheese was rotting. The cheese was dying, so to speak. And, and so all the bad things come out of that. Things here perish. The body corrupts. It decays. When Jesus went to Lazarus' tomb, he told the men, I want you to open up the tomb, roll away the stone, and let him come out. And Martha said, I don't think that you want to do that. He's been dead for four days, and he stinks. He was decaying. When I was just a boy, I remember there was a, a fellow who lived down next to the road where you turned up to go to the church building. This old man lived there for years and sometimes he would come to church. And one summer we noticed that he hadn't been around for a while. He was too old and too poor to travel, so it wasn't likely that he'd gone anywhere. So we thought it best that we would go check on him and so someone from the church went down to the house and they noticed that there was a crack in one of the windows and out of that crack there were big green flies flying in and out so they knocked on the door and nobody responded and then since there was appeared nobody was there or something's gone wrong they decided to break the door down and as they did when the door opened up that that stench just flowed out of the house because that man had died under the hot Kentucky sun the man had died and the body was decaying in that house the body this body is perishable it doesn't last now, the resurrection body is going to be around for a long time, so it must last. It'll be here for eternity, and so God needs to make that body tough. It has to be durable to last a long, long time. 
So it's better because it's a body that's built for eternity, a body that's going to last. Then the resurrection body is also better because it's built for splendor. Verse 43 says the body goes into the grave and it goes in, dis in dishonor. What do you do with a dead body? Nobody wants to keep a dead body around for very long. No, you, you take a dead body to the funeral home. The mortician does his best to make it look good. He combs the hair very neatly. He dresses the body in a nice suit and a tie. Then the family comes around and looks at the mortician's work and they say, oh, he looks so natural. You know, I never figured that out. I mean, if your, look, if your death look is natural, there's something wrong with you. Uh, he looks so natural, they say. But as good as this body looks, as good as that mortician cleans it up and makes it look natural, you're not going to keep it. You won't keep it. You take that body and you put it in the ground as soon as you can because a dead body is no good to anyone. But this body that comes out of the grave will be different. It comes out a glorious body. That's what he says in the second clause of verse 43. It's raised in glory. It's, it's minus all the defects. There are no scars on this body. There are no bruises on this body. It's not a pound overweight. It's exactly as it should be. Raised in glory to live in glory. It's a body built for the splendor of heaven. Here's a third reason why this body is so much better. It's a body that's built for speed. It's sown in weakness. It is raised in power. Now it goes into the grave completely helpless. In fact, that body can't even get into the grave by itself. Somebody's got to put it there. But when it's raised, it's raised in power. This is the new improved you. As quick as a flash, when Christ comes, that body goes up. Now I like to think about what this body will be able to do. What's the fastest way that you could travel from here to the nearest star? Did you know if you could travel to the nearest star, that's Alpha Centauri, if you could travel there at the speed of light, that it would take you 4.3 light years. Now that might not mean anything to you until you start to understand just how far a light year is. A light year is 5.9 million million miles. So if you could go at the speed of light, or warp speed for all the Trekkies, if you could go at warp speed, it'd take you 4.3, over 4 years to get to the nearest star. But in the resurrected body, you can get there as fast as you can think it. Any star, any galaxy is accessible at the speed of thought. That's how fast this body will be. And then think also, it's a body that can appear anywhere. You won't be able to lock this body out of a room. You won't be able to lock it out of a building. Because this is a body that can pass through walls. And I don't know how God does that because he clearly see, says that we, it will be a material body. It's not going to be a spirit. We are not spirits when we get to heaven. This body is going to be raised. It's a material body raised. It has spiritual characteristics, but it's still a material body. How does it do this? I don't know. God changes physics, but it does. It, it can pass through walls. You remember Jesus when he came out of the grave that he appeared to the disciples. They were in a locked room, windows and doors locked because they were hiding out for fear of the Jews. They thought they're going to come and kill us too, just as they did Jesus. But suddenly, Jesus appeared in that locked room. It's an amazing body. It's built out of some sort of indestructible heavenly material. It's glorious in appearance. It has power to do things we can't even imagine. What kind of body is it? That's what they ask. And folks, that is a very good question. What kind of body is it? It's a body, a special body built for a special place. Now next, we'll look at the contrast between the bodies. Now we've already been dealing somewhat with contrast, but let me give you two more differences between the body that goes into the grave and the one that comes out. First, it's different in the inception we started with a body that's made of plain old dirt. Those of you who think very highly of yourselves, remember you're just a lump of dirt, just a plump of clay. Paul says it's sown a natural body. Now the body that Adam had was a prototype for our body. 
Now we read in verse 47 that this is a body that came from the earth. So at first, we have an earthly body because that's the way we came into the world. And when he speaks of natural body, he means the body that's made out of this earth. 1 Corinthians 15, 48, As is the earthy, so are they also that are earthy. So all of us got a body that looks like Adam's, made of the same material as Adam's. Now, now pay very close attention because if you get nothing out else out of this sermon today, you need to get this, this first part, that the first thing that happened to you is that you were born into this world and you received all of the characteristics of Adam. Adam was made a living soul because God gave him physical life. And everything that happened to Adam flows to you as a human being. So when Adam sinned, the guilt of his transgression also flowed to you. Adam died spiritually when he sinned. And every person that comes into the world is born in that sinful nature, in a natural body that's sinful and spiritually dead. But Paul goes on to talk about a second man who came to the earth. He was not a created being. He is eternal God. And he came as a life-giving spirit. Verse 45, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit or a spirit that makes alive. So the second man, the last Adam, didn't come to this world to get life. He already had life. He didn't come to get it. He came to give life because he's God. So first you have to be born to get physical life. And then to receive spiritual life, you must be born again. And this is what Jesus came to do. He came to give spiritual life. And so as you receive physical life by being born into the world, you will receive a spiritual body when you're born again. You will receive this spiritual body because being born again, you are born into the kingdom of God. This is what Paul is saying. The natural body came first. The spiritual body will come afterwards, but only to those that are born again. Jesus said, you must be born again. And if you're not born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. So you see, there's a difference in the inception. The physical body is given physical life. That body's not suited for heaven. But the born again believer is given spiritual life. And he will receive a spiritual body that's built specially for heaven. Well, there's one other point that I'd like to make for you today. And that is, number two, it's different in image. Verse 48, as is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. As we have born the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. We live in a physical body that has all the characteristics of the first man created. It has all the limitations of the physical body. Our ears have limited range. Our, our sight is only good so far. That's why we need glasses, and that doesn't help to see any further than humans can look. Our legs can only walk as far until they get tired. Our minds are subjected to mental exhaustion. All of those things are in the image of Adam. But when we rise in the spiritual body, we will bear the image of the heavenly. That is, we're going to be made into the image of Jesus Christ, made into the image of God, so that this body is very much like the body of Jesus Christ, made in His image. And it will have all these characteristics that I spoke of before, the longevity, the speed, and those things. It has all of that, no sin in it. But I think that Paul also has something else in mind than just different physical limitations of these bodies. But he also means that when we go to heaven, we'll have a body that's dedicated 100% to the worship and the glory of God. The physical body has a mind that thinks wrong thoughts. We have eyes that see wrong things. We have ears that listen to the wrong speech and to music that defiles. Our hands lead us into corruption. Our feet take us places we shouldn't go. Paul describes it in Romans chapter 3. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. 
There is no fear of God before their eyes. Do you see what he's saying here? From the head to the toe, from top to bottom, this body is corrupt. From the crown of the head to the sole of the feet, we are corrupt. And throughout our lives, our, our bodies have been involved in gross corruption. That's because it exists in the image of Adam. But our improved body will be different. It's a new body that has all faculties that are channeled towards the glory of God. And so there's not one ounce of your spiritual body that will be used for anything other than service to God. And you wouldn't have it that way. When you get to heaven, you wouldn't have it any other way because that's what it means to be made in the image of Christ. In the image of Christ, and you look at Christ, and what did he do? He always pleased the Father. In a very real sense, this is what Paul taught the Thessalonians in the first part of chapter 4. Ye have received how ye ought to walk, and to what? Please God. When we get to heaven, we'll always please God. And we'll do it in a body that's built to do it forever. Now with that information, we can go a little bit further in 1 Corinthians 15. This compares to 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 17. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So the body that's snatched up doesn't die. It doesn't die, but it can't go as it is. It must be changed. It must be a glorified body. Just as those bodies that come out of the graves are changed, the resurrection body is glorified, so the body of the Christian who is alive when Christ comes is instantly changed to be like Jesus Christ. Without that change, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So you will be changed into an incorruptible, glorified body that's made for heaven. Now, I'm out of time today. You've been patient, but there's more to learn from the passage. So we'll come back and talk some more. This return of Christ should be exciting news for every Christian. You're believers, and whether you live or die, this is what you'll get. You will get a, a glorified body that's made like Jesus Christ. So what ought we to do? What well, we ought to live with that expectation. All sorrows, all heartaches, all problems that exist in the natural body now, they'll all be done away with. All the stuff that you have to go through in this corrupted body, that's going to end. It all goes away. But we need to emphasize this, that Paul shows us and says nothing about the unbeliever. He doesn't say the unbeliever will receive any of this. Unbelievers will not see this. They're in a sorry condition, whether they know it or whether they accept it. But not you. What does he say? If you believe that Jesus died and rose again. If you believe that you are a sinner. If you believe that you can't help yourself. If you believe that you're saved only by faith in the blood of the cross. If you believe that Jesus died to save you from your sins. You have a steadfast hope. You will be with Christ. And what does he say? Comfort one another with these words. Comfort one another. Friends, things will be different. It's all going to be different when Jesus comes. All different for those that are believers in him. Comfort one another with these words. You know Jesus is coming back. Let's pray. Thank you for listening to this presentation of the Brian Baptist Church of Roner Park, California. If you would like further information about our church, please feel free to call us at area code 707 584-7275 or write to us at Berean Baptist Church 6298 Country Club Drive Rohnert Park, California 94928 Additionally, you may visit us online at www.bebaptist.org